Welcome to Project of Scythian, uh, Scythian Hunting Kill Chain 1. Um, the title of this is Go Fish, Visualizing Basic Malice. And this will be by myself, Simon X. A little bit about myself, uh, who I am. I'm Simon X. I'm a tinkerer. I'm also a SOC team member for an organization. I am a blue team enthusiast uh, have been for many, many years. I am also an instructor, uh, but most of all, I am also a student. So let's take a look at what we're going to be learning today. First of all, we're going to learn what phishing is and what is a phishing payload uh, in uh, context of phishing. Uh, we're going to be learning what Visual Basic for Applications is. We're also gonna learn what macros are and what does this have to do with uh, phishing and threat hunting. And we'll also learn how to uh, walk through the process from, an from a hypothesis to tangible results during a threat hunt. Also, we're gonna recognize what tools do we have in our arsenal and what can we do with it uh, for our threat hunt. So let's take a look at phishing. So phishing is still one of the most common uh, attack methods in use today. Uh, generally what phishing uh, means is that it's a way for a, uh, uh, an adversary to get credentials or information from an individual uh, via nefarious or malicious means. A phishing payload is the method of getting that data. So a, a phishing payload could be a, a document, a, a zip file, a, a link in an email. We also are gonna learn uh, there are differences between these different types of payloads. We'll see that a little bit later. Here are a couple of examples of some phishing payloads that I've seen in my actual day-to-day uh, -day experience. Here's one example. So this is an IT security update from the IT help desk. And if you look at this, it is has so many warnings that a user would be, I'd be surprised if a user would actually click on the, the email uh, link that's in it. However, let's take a look at it. Uh, Microsoft gives you a, uh, an email uh, header that says it's this person's from outside of your organization. Um, they also have another one inside uh, saying that the email was from an external source. The warnings are there. In the actual body of the email, we see it says uh, your email account will be deactivated shortly. To stop deactivation, click here. Companies are not going to do that. They click on the, if somebody were to click on the click here button, it would take them to a, a site that would have them enter their credentials. Part of what makes phishing a little bit more concerning is that the attack, the adversaries will try to use a sense of urgency or uh, you need to do this immediately or you need to do this before the end of the day or, or you'll lose something or we'll charge you or something like that. Take another uh, look at another uh, one. Say the user clicks on a link that says, hey, here's something that, here's some money that you owe. Uh, we need you to review it. So they would click on the link and they would get something like this. This is obviously uh, inside of a web page, And there is a box that says uh, that your authentication is needed to log into this document. Um, this is not legit. We have another one as well. This is comes from, um, goes back to the urgency that we discussed earlier. This is an invoice that's urgent. Um, if you take a look at the spelling in the email, uh, there's often misspellings. That's not always a uh, absolute tell, but it's one of those signs that could mean that it is uh, potentially malicious. And then we have the invoice.dlcx, uh, which is a Microsoft Word document that most likely has a uh, malicious payload uh, inside of it via a macro, 
which we'll learn about later. So Visual Basic for Applications, um, uh, we call it VBA for short, um, but it's Microsoft's generous gift for extensibility in Office. So what this does, this allows for adding functionality in Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Access, um, Microsoft Project, I believe, or Publisher. Uh, but what that does is it allows the uh, an, a file to interact with the operating underlying operating system or other Office applications to transfer data or do different things between different applications uh, automatically. That's it could be a good thing, but it more than likely is a bad thing. We refer to these uh, functions as macros. And as I discussed, it's not limited in scope to just the Office applications, which is what makes this kind of a bigger issue, um, it, um, except if it were not just limited to the Office applications. As I said, this can be a rather large concern um, with the amount of privilege and the actions that can be done with this uh, functionality. This can actually be weaponized by adversaries, and we'll see an example of that here shortly. Um, the macros can perform the actions automatically and without, sometimes without obvious signs, just by opening a document or a file that contains active macros. What are the implications? If a user downloads a, an email, uh, a file from an email and they open the document and they click a button that could activate uh, ad additional downloads of malicious uh, files from an adversary's um, systems. What does a macro look like? Here's an example of a macro that is not legitimate, um, but this is what uh, the macro interface looks like in uh, Microsoft Office applications. So let's think a little bit about what our scenario is right now. Let's say I'm a new team member of the Magnum Tempest uh, MT security team. I've been asked to build a threat hunt based on what I think might have been missed in the environment, but I've never done a threat hunt before. Where do I start? So first things first, what you need to do is we need to start with a hypothesis. Uh, all threat hunts need to start with a hypothesis in mind because you need to know what you're looking for. For me, I'm focusing on macro usage in the environment. So visual basic for applications macros. I'm gonna start with a broad hypothesis and I'm going to presume that Magnum Tempest employees receive malicious documents uh, or malicious emails. This is a good starting point, but it's far too broad because uh, malicious emails, uh, yes, we will get that, but we need to kind of refine that uh, hypothesis a little, little more direct. So let's, let's refine. And what we come up with is Magnum Tempest employees are targeted with malicious Microsoft documents containing BBA macros via phishing email. And we're going to presume that some employees will download and open and detonate these malicious documents. Uh, what's important to note about this is that a lot of what we're going to be going over and doing here is specifically structured towards the Splunk query language, but these concepts can be applied to any platform, any uh, query language. And there are also online applications or tools that will allow you to uh, convert from one query language to another. Well, we won't be discussing that here, but that, that is available. So let's start with the, the threat hunt. So we need to start with a query in Splunk, but we need to know what sources we have available. So yeah, we could start 
by just going uh, across the entire platform and just go um, index equals asterisk. Let's take a look and see what we get when we do that. So we're going to type index equals star. We have no, no hits right now, but that's because we need to go to the timeline here. And for, for lack of a better time, time period, let's go with all time and then click on search. Interesting, we have nothing. So let's take a look. Let's kind of refine a little bit more. Oh, we do. As you see, the uh, search is increasing. Uh, this is more, these are more entries than we could ever want to go through and parse. And this number is just gonna go higher and higher. Let's stop this right now. Let's go back to, to our drawing board. Let's see what else we can do. And, and for reference, this is bad practice to do the uh, asterisk with a query because it's one, it's a great way to get server admins mad at you uh, for slowing down the system. But you might also get not get exactly what you're expecting. You might get more and you won't be able to kind of refine your, your query as much. So let's take a look at uh, a query that we could use. So this one will summarize all of the, the log uh, sources that we have in Splunk. Now I'm going to cheat because I already have this as a search in my, my history. So I'm going to add that to my search. I'm going to do all time and I'm going to search. Okay, so we see we have uh, a number of different indexes. We have 12 results. And the ones that kind of stand out to me right now is Zeek because Zeek will allow me to get uh, information about data that is being transmitted over uh, the wire, so over the network. Let's go back and look and see what we can do with that information. So this is what we saw. Again, we're gonna start with Zeek. Let's see what, what files are transmitted over the network. So instead of putting the asterisk, we're gonna go index Zeek. And as I said previously, we need to set a date range for the, what we're going through. And for the example, we're gonna use uh, February 11th to February 13th of 2022. Index equals Zeek. I'm going to do date range between February 11th and February 13th. I'm going to apply that. And then we're going to search. As you still see, we still have uh, a rather large amount of events. So we need to refine that a little bit better. Go back to our drawing board. We already know that we're dealing with Microsoft Office documents uh, and with the macro behavior. So let's see what we can do. Um, so our typical Microsoft document files that we typically see being transmitted over uh, email and attacks are dot doc dot docx dot xls and dot xlsx so you have microsoft word documents and excel documents let's see if we can add that to the, to the query like this index equals zeke dot doc or dot docx or dot xls or dot xlsx so let's add that to our query 
and I have that here. So let's query that. Okay, we're getting better. We have 863 events. So let's scroll through and see what we can see. That's still a lot of documents. So we, we want to see, can we refine that a little bit better? See what, what we can do. So as you see, we saw 863 events. What do we what do we find? There were a lot of events. We can probably never done this more. So we've got the initial uh, entry uh, index equals Zeek dot doc, dot uh, these document formats. But this is also probably a good great point to bring up something that's integral for bird hunting. Take notes. Uh, you need, we need to know what we did, what worked, what didn't work. And uh, for the purposes of this, we're, we're keeping track uh, as we go along. How could we refine this search? Since we're focusing on supposed phishing emails, we can look at common terms that are used in phishing documents. SANS has a cool uh, extensive list. Uh, it's not comprehensive, but it's very useful um, at this link here. And uh, we can use some terms to fine tune the search. So let's add some of the ones that I found um, invoice. We see a lot of that or remit or payment or order. So let's go back to Splunk and see how that looks. So while these are common uh, phishing email um, document names, or it could be part of emails, we're not getting very many hits. We're actually getting no hits. So let's go back to the drawing board. Let's try using another index. This is Sysmon. So what Sysmon will do, Sysmon will is essentially giving you telemetry from the endpoint, uh, much how Z gives you telemetry from the um, network. So let's add Syscmon to that and see if we have any hits. Again, no hits, okay. So perhaps we should try a different approach. Let's go back. As you see, we had no, no event. Okay. So what can we do to get better results? Again, we wanna probably go back to our notes, kind of see what we've done so far, what hasn't worked, and let's see what else we can do to kind of uh, fine tune, maybe do some uh, external searching, see what we can kind of do to uh, get better results. What, but we need to go back and remember what were we looking for when we started, right? We're looking for visual basics for applications, macro evidence tied to office documents obtained via email. Is there a way for us to determine via logs that a macro has been executed? Yes, obviously, because uh, uh, SANS actually has a really nice uh, explanation of uh, registry uh, entries that will indicate that the macro has been activated. Um, according to SANS, we can look for something called trust records, and this indicates macro execution on a, on a system. And uh, for, this is from the, uh, the webpage from SANS. It points out um, one of few places where macro execution leaves traces is in the trust records entry in the registry. And we can see that right here in this box. 
Um, and that's something that we can use in our search. So let's try to add that and see if we can try and find trust record in our query. So we're going to stick with our initial index in Zeek and Sysmon. And we're going to uh, add trust records to that. We're going to take this out. I'm going to do trust records. And let's see what we get. Okay, so we get 48 events. Let's see what we have. Okay, so we're going to look here. We see this. This file right here, employee conduct, code of conduct. But this one appears on a file server. So let's take a look and see. Okay. So this is evidence of a macro. So let's go back and look at this. Okay. So we have a result. And the first event we see. It's a an internal uh, file share, as we, we noticed. What's the significance of it being a file share? Uh, it appears to be a company file share. We're looking for documents downloaded by a user via email. We're not going to likely see this on a file share, at least not in, initially. Um, we would expect to see it on a, on a user's uh, desktop or endpoint. Um, so let's take a look at see how many of these events are located on the file share. So by doing that and doing that, we're going to have the trust records, but then we're going to add in an and files.magnumtempestfinancial.com. Let's go back to our Splunk. And I have that here, files.magnumtempest.com. Let's take a look and see what, what it is. So we get 26 events. Okay. Employee code of conduct. Employee code of conduct. Marketing template. Marketing template. Oh, okay. So at this point, I am fairly confident that that's not necessarily malicious. Could be, but going based off of my hypothesis of being from an email, I'm going to disregard these files for now. So going back to our, we, we saw 26 events associated with the file store. So now let's do the inverse, uh, removing the file share event from our query. So all we're going to change is not in the query. Well, this gives us 22 events, which is better because this is a little bit more for us to, to work with. Okay, so let's look at this. So the first one is trust records, user profile, downloads. Downloads, that's what we're looking for. Magnum Tempest, policy violation, Matt Trist Tristique at magnumtempestfinancial.com. Okay, so this one stands out because I would not expect to see a user's email address in a document that uh, is being sent from, um, a, a legitimate internal uh, group. Um, what we do know is that uh, having uh, templates and sending out to mass uh, users 
you might see the name like this, but having the entire email just kind of signifies that this might be, could be malicious, but we, we need to kind of dig a little bit deeper. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, okay, we have another similar one from a different user, uh, Amanda Nuensis. Okay, so let's go back to our drawing board. So we ran the query, so we do have 22 events. Are we done? No, uh, but we do have 22 events. Uh, and like I said, we do have that uh, file name stands out to me as potentially an issue. And it stands out because the naming convention is odd. Why would there have an email address in the file name, right? Um, the lo location indicates that it's downloaded on the user's endpoint in both scenarios, downloads and desktop, which you'd expect if you were downloading an email from uh, on an actual endpoint. The, it also indicates that the trust record section was triggered for the file, which, as we know, indicates macro activity. Can we find similar files? Let's refine our query knowing that we know the file name and what we may su suspect to be a malicious file. So we're going to stick with uh, index in Zeek and Sysmon, but we're going to go with Magnum Tempest dash policy dash violation dash. And let's see what this results. So we have 40 events for this. Let's take a look at this. Okay, I'm not sure what this is. This looks like the, these are, are Zeek logs, but these might not be parsed. So that could be an issue. Um, but let's look down a little bit deeper. Okay. So we knew Amanda Nunes, Nunes uh, downloaded this file. And it looks like uh, it was caught as a forced authentication. However, we also noticed that this was not parsed as well. So that's another thing for us to add to our notes. And we scroll down, we see more. Matt Nunes. So we see Matt, Matt Tristik again. And Matt Tristik. So right now, all we see is Matt and Amanda. So let's go back and see, uh, can we refine this more? So we know we have 40 events available to us. We looked at what we, what we saw. The first events has not been parsed. Let's note this so we can notice in our findings. But like we said, it, we saw that there was one that had a drive-by compromise. Um, the program used was Thunderbird and it fits the file, target file name that we were discussing previously. Now, I don't know a whole lot about the organization yet, uh, but it appears that the organization uses Thunderbird as a mail client. So can we refine that a little bit deeper knowing that, uh, that little bit of information? So let's go back and we're gonna add thunderbird.exe to our query. Okay, we're down to 12 events. Again, if we look at these, they're not done, uh, they're not parked correctly. So that's something to note that. We're going through, Amanda downloaded it. Amanda 
Karen Newton's also appears to have downloaded this. Okay, so let's see what, what do we have. So go back. At this point, uh, with our previous query, we see that we have 12 entries. Uh, scrolling, we see two additional users downloaded, uh, Amanda Nunez and uh, Karen Mutens. What does this mean? At this point, we validated our initial hypothesis that a Microsoft Office document was downloaded from email by the end users and that it contained Visual Basic for Applications macros. Are we done? We can be. We, we've satisfied our hypothesis and our uh, investigation or our threat hunt. Um, however, if you're like me, you like might be interested in digging a bit deeper to see if you can find more information about these spirals. So what does this mean? We need to go deeper. So what's next? So we, we have other tools available to us that um, might be useful. Uh, we have access to the packet capture uh, for network traffic. That's done, that's a Zeek, but we can actually be able to kind of uh, look at our traffic flows and actually rebuild those traffic flows. And that's what we call a packet capture um, or we call it PCAP for short. A common tool that we use to browse and hunt in a PCAP file is called Wireshark. Let's load up Wireshark with the appropriate PCAP and let's see what we can find. Once we load the PCAP, we can start searching for some information that we located in our hunt. Let's look back and remember that we found a file name that was opened by multiple users. And the file name was uh, Magnum Tempest dash policy dash violation dash user email dot doc. Okay, so we know that. Knowing that the company's name is Magnum Tempest, we, we probably should avoid using that because it's possible we could end up with other uh, uh, events that we were not really interested in. What stands out to me in this would be the policy dash violation dash. It could be very unique to the file name. So let's proceed uh, with searching for this because if you remember, we only had 12 hits uh, for that file name. So let's load up Wireshark. So I already have Wireshark already up and ready to go. But what we want to do is we want to do Control F. We'll change this. It starts off the packet list. We're going to go to packet details. This starts off as display filter. We're going to switch the string. I already have policy validation in here. But if you didn't have anything in there, it would be red. So you would type policy dash violation dash and you hit enter and it's going to take a little bit of time to search for it but we did we found one right here so if you see here it says action required internal it policy violation from legal dash internal at magnum tempest dot financial at this point we can right click we can follow bcp stream so what this will do this will bring up the uh, stream of data that is uh, associated with this particular packet. So let's do that now. This will take a little bit to load. Go back to our uh, document real quick. So here's uh, an explanation of how to switch the uh, display filter to the string. So 
So as we saw, we saw action required internal IT policy violation from legal-internal at magnumtempestfinancial.com, as we saw. Again, uh, this is where we will uh, right-click and follow uh, TCP Stream. But again, TCP Stream will give you the actual uh, data uh, flow for that particular packet where it uh, exists. The colors indicate whether data was sent or received. Let's go back to our information. So there's a lot of data here, but so if we scroll a little bit, we will see the original, the email that we were referring to. So subject, uh, action required internal IT policy violation from legal-internal at magnumtempest.financial. So this one was sent to so, so this, so let's say Acuna. So this file, this is the email itself, the actual email text that was sent. Um, what stands out here is this is uh, network traffic. So network traffic by in a in a good network should be encrypted, especially with emails. You should never be able to see email text over a um, over a network. That's a security issue. That's also something to note uh, uh, when you're uh, keeping track. What we see here too, this is the file name that we were expecting. Uh, Magnum Tempest-IT policy violation. And then we have the uh, username here that doc is what we expected. And then what we have here is a base 64 encoded blob of text. But what this will do is if you were to take this and send this to uh, reverse the base 64 encryption, what will happen is you can recreate this attachment, this document uh, that contains the macro uh, files in it. So let's go back to our, so like we said, we had needed to scroll a little bit to get to the, uh, what we needed. Again, so let's take a look at what we said. In one and two, we're seeing the subject and, and, the, uh, and the from that we saw before. In number three, we're seeing what appears to be the email contents in plain text. Um, this is concerning, as I said previously, that uh, unencrypted uh, email over the wire is not a good thing. Uh, it could be a misconfiguration um, by the uh, server admins when they set up email. In number four and five, we notice that this is a base 64 encoded attachment and the file name matches what we would expect to see based on what we did in Splunk. Again, it's important to recognize that um, because it's basically 64 we have the ability to uh, turn that into an actual uh, document or file. At this point, what's next? At this point, we could dive further, investigate. We could uh, uh, try to download the attachment and see what macros are inside of it. However, this might be a good point for us to stop and uh, pass off to the next team to proceed with their investigation or their threat hunt. Um, but it's also a chance for us to take a look and uh, check our notes. Um, what we want to do is, so for our threat hunter playbook, our playbook title is going to be Detecting Enterprise Macro Activity from Emails. The minor tactic is T1566, which is phishing but we're also going to use the sub-technique uh, 001 spear phishing attachment because based on what we know so far, this could be um, a spear phishing attachment. So we're gonna take our initial hypothesis, which is that employees are targeted with malicious documents. 
with VBA macro code, and some employees will open the documents and detonate the payload. Based on what we've seen, that is the case. Uh, the proposed detection query is index in, Zeek and syslog, dot doc, or dot XLS, or dot docx, or dot XLSX, trust records, and not files.magnumtempestfinancial.com. We have no simulation details. And for the hunter limitations observation notes, during several portions of the hunt, we discovered that there were log sources that were not properly parsed, which made finding details difficult. Hunt findings. Three users downloaded the malicious document. Two users appear to have been affected by the payload. And that brings us to the end of the talk. Thank you so much to join the conversation. Join us at discord.blueteamvillage.org. Thank you.